Hi everyone, this is lecture 9 for POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. And uh, today we're going to cover um, an introduction to utopian political thought, and also we're going to talk about uh, the first section of Edward Bellamy's book, Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, uh, which you have read for today. So this is really the beginning of something entirely different. Uh, thus far in the course, we've primarily been reading philosophical pieces. These are pieces that attempt to analyze concrete realities of their society or timeless questions. Um, you know, what is justice? What is obligation? When do we obey the state? Um, and generally, they offer some alternative vision of the future. Many of the pieces that we've read are um, critical. They're... Um, analyzing the deficiencies of their own society, but they do so with this explicit goal. And it's made clear that this is their purpose. They address us, the reader, directly, and they challenge us in certain ways to engage those questions. They don't really offer us a story. They don't offer us a narrative. The obvious exception being the Republic. Um, that is, to a certain extent, a story, a narrative. Um, so is the defense of Socrates. So is um, the Crito. But those pieces, um, you know, we wouldn't read them necessarily for their, um, for their narrative, for their plot line, right? Uh, they're primarily dialogues. These are just, there's a setting and there's certain characters, but the core focus is to engage those philosophical questions directly. Um, and the idea is they're laid bare for us. We see them, we judge them, and we critique them. And that's really only one type of political theory. If you look at human history, what you realize is that um, fiction and literature and even art and photography, um, those mediums have a certain power as well. They can change the way that we view a situation. They can frame an injustice. They can uh, help us recognize suffering and, and kind of uh, compel us, motivate us to alleviate that suffering. Um, so for instance, um, this is a, a really famous example. Many of you have probably been exposed to this novel in some form, but um, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. That's a fictional novel, right? And it documents the injustice of slavery in the United States, but it does so via fiction. It does so through, um, through fictional characters. Many uh, individuals, many writers, many philosophers up until that time had critiqued uh, slavery. They had argued against the practice um, in some form or another, right? But there's something about uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and reading about slavery in a novel, you know, a, a narrative form, a fictional form that helps us identify with the characters. And it made that piece of work unique. And many have said that without Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852. If you didn't have that, if you didn't have that fictional perspective, that narrative, um, that, that literary account, then the abolitionist movement in the United States really couldn't have had the political impact it had. So, so it plays a crucial role. Um, and it plays a crucial role in part because of how well it makes the argument, but also the medium through which it makes the argument. Um, but the focus isn't always on what exists, right? It's the the, the purpose of um, of uh, a novel is is not always to um, to to document ongoing injustices. Um, sometimes fictional writers turn to some future state, some future condition of humanity, and they kind of construct what it might look like. And sometimes this is to warn us. So we could think of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, he offers us a picture of the future, and it's a nightmare, right? It's a um, this again is probably a novel that some of you have been exposed to, but George Orwell's vision of the future is one in which the state invades and controls every aspect of our lives, and it crushes human individuality and freedom. And that's meant to show us that we have to be careful. We have to guard against society becoming something that none of us would want it to be. Um, and that's what we call a dystopian novel. Right, um, George Orwell's 1984 is a dystopia, but other times fictional writers write about a future that we should aspire to. 
something we should attempt to create, an ideal vision in which the problems in our society, the injustices, the contradictions, the conflicts are transcended. And that's really what utopian fiction and utopian political thought have tried to do. It attempts to show us this picture of an ideal society that exists in another time, another place. It transports us beyond the world in which we live and um, kind of puts us in a place that we rarely imagine. And Edward Bellamy's novel, Looking Backward, is an attempt to do this. Uh, it has a specific focus on how the problems of his own time related to capitalist economic relations. So um, in some senses, there's, well, in really important senses, there's a link here with Marx, who you've just read. Um, and Bellamy is really focused on how these problems can be um, transcended. So today, what we'll cover, um, I'll provide a bit of an introduction to ut utopian political thought as a genre, as you know, what utopian political thought tries to do and how we might read it. And I'll also talk about Edward Bellamy as a man and as a political figure. Um, you're probably not aware of him. Uh, he's kind of faded into obscurity uh, to a certain extent. But in his own time, he was an incredibly important figure. And Looking Backward was um, an incredibly important work. It was the third um, highest selling novel of its time behind Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ben-Hur um, and really resonated with a lot of people. A lot of people took Bellamy seriously and read him. Um, we'll also talk about the basic plot line of the book and some of the characters and um, we'll get into the first section of the book, some of the political questions, some of the positions that are laid out there. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, but before we do that, before we move into the book itself, I want to talk about how we might approach utopian political thought, how to think about utopian political thought, because this is one of these um, genres in which it's important to think about how to read this and how you choose to read it will shape what you take away from it, whether you think it's valuable, whether you dismiss it entirely. Um, and there's, there's really different approaches that one can take when you're reading utopian political thought, and in particular, utopian political fiction. So the first way that we might try to think about um, utopian political thought is as a blueprint, right? Um, this is um, a genre which offers us characters, events, particulars. It's, um, in some ways, it's an implicit critique of the existing order, right? Um, the suffering, the evil, the degradation of humanity associated with it. And it's a concrete vision of a better or even perfect alternative. Something, something which overcomes those problems, that suffering, those injustices. And ideally, if we're thinking about utopian political thought or utopian fiction as a blueprint, then uh, it ought to offer us steps ways by which we transition from this one mode of political organization that we recognize as deficient, we recognize as imperfect, to another. Right? Um, so one way you might think about this is as a blueprint. Second way that you can approach utopian political thought is um, less applied, less concrete, but really as um, an attempt at moral judgment. Right? In, in this sense, reading utopian political thought, um, we see it less as a blueprint, you know, less as a plan by which to move from one set of institutions to another, and um, more as an effort to shift our understanding of why the world is the way it is. So um, let me explain. Basically, when you think of utopian political thought as an attempt at moral judgment, um, you're kind of problematizing the notion that the world that is is the only possible world and you're drawing attention to the contingency of the existing state of affairs its fragility um, its vulnerability the fact that it could be changed and um, it could be changed relatively easily right so oftentimes when we talk about something that's uh, problematic or unfortunate if we talk about corruption in politics, if we talk about uh, greed in economic relations, if we talk about people who uh, commit crimes, if we talk about war and conflict, we'll say, well, you know, that's, that's human nature. It's, 
sad and it's unfortunate, but it's the only way the, the world will ever exist because that's how human beings are. And um, if we read utopian political thought, oftentimes they attempt to challenge that conception that our existing problems are rooted in human nature. They're rooted in this immutable force that you can't change, right? Um, so the, the, if you're reading utopian political thought as um, an attempt at moral judgment, then you're emphasizing the idea that things could always be different, and you're kind of reinvigorating, um, motivating, uh, creating, fostering a sense for human agency, the idea that we can control the world around us, and it's not inevitable, it's not fixed. The problems with our world can change, and we can judge them critically and attempt to, to you know, change them. Um, the best quote I've found with regard to reading utopian political thought in this way comes from a woman named Judith, Judith Sklar. She was a really famous um, political theorist, a contemporary political theorist. She died in 1992. And she says this of utopian political thought. Um, this is a quote. It is an attack on both the doctrine of original sin which is, imposes rigid limits on men's social potentialities and on all actual societies, which always fall so, so short of men's real capacities. The object of these models, however, was never to set up a perfect community, but simply to bring moral judgment to bear on the social misery to which men have so unnecessarily reduced themselves. For the fault is not in God, in fate, or nature, but in ourselves, where it will remain. To recognize this, to accept it, to contemplate, and to judge, this is the function of utopian political thought. Right? So the things that we see wrong with the world around us are not um, immutable. They're not fixed. It's not God's will. It's not fate. It's not human nature. Right? It's our fault. <laughs> In some senses, when you read utopian political thought as an attempt at moral judgment, it's, it involves taking the blame for what's wrong with the world around us and not saying that it's, it's a product of forces beyond their control. Um, and she also says that the object of these models, the goal of utopian political thought, was never to set up a perfect community. Right? So that's a different conception than um, the blueprint, which... You know, if that was your thinking about utopian political thought, then you would think that this is an idea to, to set up um, a perfect community. But Sklar is saying no. She's saying really what this is about, what utopian political thought is trying to do, is um, give us a sense that we are in fact responsible for the world around us and um, kind of compel us, motivate us to judge that world, right? Um, the last way that we might read utopian political thought is um, more of an activist orientation. It's more of a challenge to the reader. Um, so through this lens, it's, it's not simply about contemplation and it's not simply about judgment. Um, this last way of looking at utopian political thought sees it as a source of action. It's not simply about a different way of thinking. Um, a piece of political literature which is utopian will instill us uh, to actually instill within us a drive to actually engage in the existing system and try to change it, though not necessarily in the exact direction of any preconceived blueprint. So it's an attack on um, our complacency with the existing order. It's an attempt to expose its deficiency, but also compel us to do something about it. It's supposed to jar us. It's supposed to shake us out of our political and, in some senses, moral slumber and um, compel us to act. And um, this is a more activist take on utopian political thought, and in particular with regard to fiction, right? Uh, if we think about literature, if we think about art, if we think about photography, um, those are mediums which have a much wider appeal and potentially can have a wider resonance than a philosophical treatise. So um, I think uh, 
Bellamy and looking backward, you know, as you read it, you'll get a sense that it's more accessible than Locke. It's more accessible than Machiavelli, perhaps, right? Um, because it's written in the narrative style, because there are characters, because there are, you know, a, a plot line that we can follow. And you could conceivably read Looking Backward just as a story, right? Um, with no, you know, political implications whatsoever. You're not reading it to better understand your political world. You're simply reading it as a form of escape, right? Um, because it has such a, a wide appeal, because it is in that narrative form, though, um, it does have the ability to reach lots of individuals. And maybe it resonates with them. Maybe it kind of shocks them to the point where they say, yeah, you know, this is a novel, it's a piece of fiction, but it makes me think about my own world and want to change it. Um, so there's an element of, of mass appeal in particularly in utopian fiction that um, oftentimes will motivate people to action. And um, I mentioned Uncle Tom's Cabin. That's certainly the case with Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, a lot of people said, well, you know, I was kind of on the fence with regard to um, the abolitionist movement until I read Uncle Tom's Cabin. And then I got this sense that this was, you know, slavery was an incredible injustice and I needed to step up and do something in order to confront it, right? Um, so those are the different ways that we can approach utopian political thought. Um, I'll also say that utopian political thought is uh, in incredibly controversial. And, and a lot of people challenge the tradition of utopian theorizing, right? Um, a lot of political theorists even challenge that, that tradition of um, utopianism. And oddly enough, they seem to apply the same critique which um, Socrates and his friends were concerned with in the Republic, which we've, we've talked about. Um, remember, in the Republic, Socrates is grappling with this question. This is right before the allegory of the cave. He's grappling with this question of the idea that uh, philosophy, the, the act of engaging in philosophy, is seen as useless at best and dangerous at worst. And the same critique is um, is launched against utopian political thought in all its forms. In certain instances, um, in a lot of ways, actually, the, the Republic is an instance of utopian theorizing. They are creating the ideal city, the city in speech. Um, but this critique that um, theorizing of this sort is useless at best and dangerous at worst doesn't simply apply to the Republic. It applies to all utopian political thought and utopian political fiction. Um, so why is it useless, <laughs> according to its critics? Um, it's useless in the sense that it, it presents a vision of a society that is so far removed from our own that it's unclear how we would ever get there. Right? As you read Looking Backward, you're going to find this society that is has transcended all, all of our contemporary social, economic, and political problems, right? It is a perfect society. It is a vision of perfection. There are no problems. There are no injustices. Um, some individuals read that and say, well, that's, you know, how do we get there? How do we actually move towards that? How do we ever achieve that? And the practical steps that we would need to take in order to achieve it are unclear. That's one of the most frustrating things about reading Looking Backward is Edward Bellamy's tremendous faith that we will evolve in these directions, that we will simply realize as human beings, as rational human beings, that the society we have is unjust and insufficient and move towards an alternative. And, um, you know, the pragmatists among us say, no, that's not the way it works. Um, Change is slow, change encounters resistance, it takes time, and we need some sort of practical guide for how we engage in this sort of change. And many utopian political thinkers don't provide us with that. Okay. Um, so at, at best, right, um, critics will say that utopian political thought is useless. Um, the real critics will say that this is dangerous. Utopian political thought is dangerous. 
And um, the reason that they think that is, is because it, um, it, utopian political thought is seen as um, inherently, because of what it is, lending itself towards violence. Um, you have this vision of what ought to exist. You have this vision of what ought to be, right? And it is um, so sweeping and so fundamentally different from the world that currently exists. And it is a single vision of what is perfect. It is a singular conception of what is perfect that um, some individuals, some critics look at this and say, yeah, the only way that you would ever achieve this is through violence. Right? It's too dogmatic. It's too focused on a singular vision. Um, going back to, to Berlin, we had this idea of monism. Right? Um, critics look at utopian political thought and they say that is a vision of politics that leads itself to monism. It leads itself to a single conception of what ought to be. And when you have a narrow vision, when you have a kind of single vision of what ought to be, that naturally lends itself to the violent imposition of that vision upon others. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at history, any time that we start off with a grand vision of what should be or what could be, um, or at least most of the time when we do that, we begin to justify very, very frightening curtailments of human freedom in order to justify its implementation. Um, you could think about the communist societies. Uh, you could think about the Soviet Union or the societies of Eastern Europe that have fallen. And that was a singular vision of what ought to be. And oddly enough, it was rooted in freedom. It was rooted in liberating the worker. But those societies ended up as the most oppressive societies on the face of the earth because they couldn't tolerate any disagreement. They couldn't tolerate any deviation from that single vision. Um, if you've, if you're kind of familiar with European history, right, the French Revolution, um, the motto of the French Revolution was um, equality, fraternity, right? It had this vision that we were going to free these oppressed um, individuals who were being oppressed by the, the aristocracy and the monarchy. And um, that was what compelled people to, to go out into the streets and fight. But after the revolution had succeeded, um, it began essentially a reign of terror. I mean, thousands of people were murdered in the streets in the aftermath of the French Revolution. They call the period the terror. Um, that, again, arose out of a singular vision. We could talk about Nazism. We could talk about um, fundamentalist communities. They have a singular vision, and it is in some senses, a utopian vision. I mean, for the people that believe that vision, they view it as a utopia. They view themselves as creating the perfect society. But the problem is when you have a singular um, vision of perfection and it's going to be implemented on a grand scale, anyone who gets in the way can be legitimately, in your eyes, eliminated or imprisoned or tortured or punished, right? Um, so many people look at utopian political thought and they say, well, that's, it's actually incredibly dangerous. We should avoid anything that tries to advance a singular conception of what is perfect, what ought to be. And we need to have more diversity of opinion, um, kind of a broader conception of what ought to exist, and space for dialogue, right? Space for what Isaiah Berlin called um, pluralism, essentially. Um, so these are critiques that we should be mindful of. Right, we should take notice of them, um, but also notice that they tend to focus on utopian political thought in that that blueprint frame. Right, so if we go back to the previous slide here, um, blueprint, a concrete vision of a better or perfect alternative. I think that's what these critiques um, most apply to. Right, is um, utopian political thought, utopian political fiction from that that blueprint frame. Um, and when reading, looking backward, um, it's important to pay attention not only to Bellamy's blueprint, but also his attempt to instill within us moral judgment and his attempt to motivate uh, his readers to action. 
his, his attempt to kind of get us to um, actually engage with the world and try to change it. And um, furthermore, don't dismiss his blueprint outright. Just because there's a potential for violence there, just because the scale of his changes may necessitate some sort of fundamental reordering of societies based on coercion, um, really think about his suggestions. Because an easy way to dismiss a social critic like uh, Edward Bellamy is to say, oh, well, this is impractical. This will never happen. But unfortunately, I mean, that critique has been levied at plenty of people who um, actually were able to change the world, right? The civil rights movement um, encountered these critiques. Um, the movements for gay rights and uh, the rights of uh, sexual minorities have encountered this critique. Um, anyone who tries to change the world is going to face the criticism <clears throat> that what you're trying to do is impractical. Society isn't ready for this. Uh, society isn't ready for a president who's a person of color. Society isn't ready for uh, women in positions of political power. Society isn't ready for women to go vote. Society isn't ready for um, interracial marriage. You know, wh whatever uh, injustice, whatever um, forms of, of discrimination and bigotry and um, suffering that we've overcome in society has faced these criticisms as well. It's not simply limited to utopian political thought. So uh, do keep that in mind as you read. And don't assume impossibility from the outset, because that's a great way to put a damper on, try and um, quell political change that perhaps should happen. So let's talk a little bit about Edward Bellamy. <clears throat> um, Edward Bellamy was born in 1850, and he lived only 48 years. He died uh, at 48 of tuberculosis. Uh, he was from New England. He um, was born and lived in Chicopee Falls, which is, um, if you're familiar with Massachusetts, it's kind of close to Springfield, um, that out in the western part of the state. You'll notice that um, looking backward takes place in Boston, um, and Edward Bellamy did live and work in Boston for a time as an adult. Um, unlike Marx, Bellamy was kind of a superstar in his day. Uh, Bellamy was really, really well known. The publication of Looking Backward catapulted him into the national spotlight. He had been a successful journalist previously, but Looking Backward really made him a formidable political figure. Um, you know, a really kind of well-known public intellectual and social critic. He, um, like I, I think I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but this was the third highest selling book of its time behind um, Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ben-Hur. Uh, it spawned a series of responses, both uh, from individuals who were critical of Bellamy and supportive of Bellamy, um, and a variety of critics. I mean, there were, you know, individuals who were um, supportive of the ideas of capitalism, supportive of the direction that the country was taking at the time, who uh, published critiques of this, said it was rubbish, said it was um, this kind of head in the clouds theorizing that denied the reality of the society at the time. It also spawned um, critiques from the left, from people that were further to the left than Edward Bellamy and said that this was completely impractical, right? He kind of takes all the ideas of Marx about the need for society to fundamentally change, but he ignores the difficult part, which is revolution and violence. Um, there's a book called The News from Nowhere, written by a, um, a thinker and inventor and intellectual named uh, Willie Morris. And he basically said that, yeah, you know, Bellamy, <laughs> he wants the socialist society, the socialist utopia. He wants the um, society that Marx is laying out, but he doesn't want to engage in the process of revolutionary struggle. And so he's basically filling uh, people's heads with ideas that um, are unachievable based on what he's suggesting. You know, he thought that society would gradually evolve in this direction. And, uh, and Morris says, no, Bellamy's wrong. Um, 
as a result of the publication of Looking Backward, there were what are called the Bellamy Clubs established all over the United States. And their, um, their idea was to try and discuss and implement even some of the ideas of uh, economic and social organization that Bellamy lays out in Looking Backward to actually put these things into practice. Um, so he inspired utopian communities that existed in the late 19th century, and the whole genre of utopian fiction really exploded in the United States. We saw a lot of um, novels and pieces of fiction that um, were within this genre emerging in response to Bellamy and how popular Bellamy was. So he reinvigorated an entire literary genre. Um, and his influence was felt outside the United States as well. Um, Bellamy movement sprang up in places like um, the Netherlands. And the modern socialist parties that today exist in Europe were in a period of formation at that time in Europe. Um, and Bellamy's ideas had a significant impact on them as well. Right? They started to think about his ideas as they were developing their political programs, what they wanted to see. After looking backward, Bellamy devoted himself full-time to writing. He gave up the journalism. He de devoted himself full-time to writing, and he also engaged in political activism, and he became um, an advocate for uh, social reform in the United States. Uh, social reform in terms of voting rights for women, um, addressing racial injustice. Primarily, though, his focus was on um, the plight of the working class and beginning to reform some of our laws um, around the workplace, working hours, wages, um, organization of the workplace, etc., etc. Um, these ideas would eventually, if you uh, know a little bit about uh, American history, the progressive movement in the United States um, about 10, 20 years after Bellamy died uh, really began to take root and actually was able to achieve concrete political change on things like child labor and um, the eight hour work week and or the eight hour <laughs> Eight-hour work week would be nice, huh? Um, the eight-hour work day. Uh, so limitations on, um, you know, uh, the extremes of the workplace, which at that time it was, it was pretty nasty. Um, there, there weren't a lot of health and safety regulations in the workplace. It was kind of a, a Wild West type scenario. Um, so he, you know, could be looked at as a figure that um, kind of started that push that eventually led to really concrete and meaningful changes um, a couple decades after he died. Um, he would continue to lobby for social causes until his untimely death at the close of the 19th century. And I think because he impacted so many of these different movements in their accept inception, I, I think you can say that Bellamy, um, even his impact is felt today in our contemporary labor laws, um, our contemporary protections for the working class. I think he kind of started that. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that. So we should know more about this guy. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't. Unfortunately, you know, very few people um, read Bellamy. To, it, it's, it's, um, it's too bad because he really did have an impact. So why did he write Looking Backward? Um, Bellamy traveled quite a bit. He had, as a student, as a college student, he'd gone to Germany in 1868 and, um, you know, he read widely. Um, he was, he had probably been exposed to, <clears throat> uh, if not Marx, then Marxist ideas while he was in Europe. And, um, people who were writing in the socialist tradition. And, um, he began to recognize that uh, as he traveled in Europe, he saw that the side effects caused by, by capitalism. Uh, he saw that, you know, yeah, capitalism enables tremendous production, production on a scale that we haven't seen previously, but there are all of these negative um, social side effects, and the working class really suffers under uh, industrial capitalism. And he was living in, Germ in Germany as it was beginning to industrialize, as all of these things that we talked about when we were discussing Marx 
the emergence of the modern factory, the emergence of slums, right? All of these things were beginning to develop. And so he was in Germany. He said, you know, wow, this is pretty barbaric. Um, but when he returned home, he realized that, oh, yeah, I mean, we have this in the United States as well. Um, the alienation of labor, the side effects of capitalism's market system, the social and psychological effects of industrial capitalism on human beings. He realized that, yeah, this is going on in the United States as well. And um, he saw them at odds with what he believed to be, this is a quote from Bellamy, man's essential nobleness. Uh, he thought that men had, um, or humanity had, this kind of essential nobleness, goodness, and capitalism was destroying that. Capitalism was undermining that. Um, and he sought to make us aware of how capitalism led us to this condition of wretchedness, of misery, at least for the working class, but it wasn't inevitable. He thought that we could escape it. He thought that we could transcend it. Um, and so, though we've talked about a variety of different ways in which to read looking backward, um, he did at some level intend this book, looking backward, to be a blueprint or at least a reasonable approximation of what a more just, more humane society would look like. He says, um, this is a quote from him, um, quote, looking backward, although in forma of fanciful romance, is intended in all seriousness as a forecast in accordance with the principles of evolution of the next stage in the industrial and social development of humanity, especially in the U.S., and no part of it is believed by the author to be better supported by the indications of probability than the implied prediction that the dawn of the new era is already near at hand, and that the full day will swiftly follow. Um, this was a forecast. <laughs> he believed that this was going to happen, and it was going to happen relatively soon. And he also talks about... Um, evolution there, in accordance with the principles of evolution. To a certain extent, he's influenced by Darwin. To a much greater extent, he's influenced by uh, what are called social Darwinists, folks who picked up on Darwin's ideas of evolution and tried to apply them to um, humanity, who tried to apply them to societies, saying that, yeah, societies evolve in the same way that biological organisms evolve, um, practices which are harmful, practices which hurt the social organism gradually get phased out and become replaced by better um, social processes and sets of institutions. And, um, you know, Bellamy thought that as well, right? He thought that um, we had these, this set of practices, we would evolve out of it because it was deficient, because it wasn't working well for the vast majority of human beings, right? Um, so even though Bellamy may have intended this as a blueprint or a forecast of sorts. Um, keep in mind, he's just the author. There are a number of different ways that we can take what the author writes and utilize it or understand it. And so, um, you know, a blueprint, reading this as a blueprint for a future society is only one way to read it. But I think there's plenty of um, valuable ways to, um, to think about Bellamy. And most of all, I want to um, I want us to try and break out of the habit of reading something like this and saying, "Well, it's completely impractical, therefore it's useless." Well, not necessarily, right? Um, try to evaluate reforms on an independent basis rather than taking the book as this whole package of reforms to be enacted at once. Um, many of the things which Bellamy suggests have been implemented in the United States in some form. To try to think about the individual aspects of his plan rather than the plan as a whole. Um, and furthermore, it may be a tool, right? It may just be a way that we can judge not only um, capitalism as a whole, but our contemporary system. It may invigorate our sense of judgment. It may help us look at our current economic system and realize that these things are not... Um, you know, certain qualities of the, of the economic system that we currently have are not inevitable. They're not, uh, they don't emerge from nature. They could be a product of design. And perhaps we should question those structures, which we never actively think about. And um, it also may be a catalyst for action. It may give us a greater capacity to act in the face of injustice and recognize our own space for uh, human agency and action.
Um, so normally when I teach this book in the classroom, it's, um, it's very discussion based. Uh, we simply, I have that, that introduction and, and then we just sort of talk about the book for several classes. And, um, we don't really have the, the means to do that with the online course. Um, so I'm going to run through some things and, um, really my goal is to, um, kind of propose ideas and, and get us thinking and um, to supplement your reading of the text with interesting issues that I think um, Bellamy raises in his text. Um, so the first thing that we're exposed to in the text that I think is really significant is um, what's called the stagecoach analogy. Um, stagecoach analogy occurs on page six and it's an analogy that is really designed to um, make us think about how society is constructed and um, the economic structure of society, in particular, the relationship between the classes. Um, and um, he describes his society as uh, a, well, I'll just quote him. He says, I cannot do better than to compare society as it then was to a prodigious coach, which the masses of humanis humanity were harnessed to, and dragged toilsomely along a very hill, hilly and sandy road, right? Um, so there's this analogy that he introduces, and it, it's a rather lengthy description. Um, it goes from page 6 onto page 8. And he's basically talking about um, my society in the 19th century is like this stagecoach, right? And um, the vast majority of human beings, who would be the working class or um, Marx's proletariat, are pulling this stagecoach, and then there are some individuals who are riding on the stagecoach, and they are not part of that struggle. They are not part of the laborious task of dragging this coach up a very uh, steep hill, which is sandy and bumpy. Right. Um, so the road itself is long. It's uphill. It's bumpy. There's always the chance that one could be um, thrown off the top and end down. Uh, end up down below with the, the poor souls that are pulling this thing. And um, I think it's it's interesting to look at this analogy and think about how it relates to Marx and Marx's conception of socialism. Um, and I think we've, we encounter some really interesting things here that give us a sense of how Bellamy's socialism is different than Marx's socialism. Um, it's less rigid. Uh, and in a certain sense, it's more humanistic. If you look at the bottom of um, page seven, you'll see that it's not the case that those riding on the coach simply don't care for the individuals pulling the coach. It's not the case that the bourgeoisie is fundamentally self-interested and um, doesn't care about the working class. It's that it doesn't recognize that there is any other way. It doesn't recognize that there is some other way to... Um, to organize society. And so it actually, you know, the, the people riding on the co coach lament the condition of these poor people that are pulling the coach, right? But they don't recognize that they can do anything about it. They think that it's inevitable. They think that it is just natural that there is going to be this rigid division between, um, between the classes. And um, so Bellamy's trying to problematize that conception for his own society. Also, there's significantly more social mobility. Marx never really talked very much about how um, you know, individuals could fall from their position as the bourgeoisie and become part of the proletariat, and how there was um, space by which you know, one could change their class position. But for Bellamy, that's an ever-present threat. Right? He says that you know, individuals could be thrown off the top of the coach and then immediately they have to start pulling the coach. So there's an element of social mobility that's, um, that's there. Uh, the bourgeoisie is not presented monolithically. It's not necessarily presented as this unified, stable class of people. And Bellamy notes that even they are constantly in danger of winding up as proletariat workers. Um, and because of that, um, we end up with a conception 
of society and how society will change that is much less extreme than Marx. Bellamy believes that society is going to evolve away from capitalism and into a socialist society. Um, and he thinks that because it's not the case that the people riding on the coach and the people pulling the coach are these fundamentally opposed classes who um, are out to marginalize and exploit one another. He simply thinks that the reason why you have this division between the classes is that the individuals within society don't realize that there's an alternative. They don't realize that they could um, pursue this endeavor in a different way. They don't realize that society doesn't have to have this rigid distinction between the poor and the rich. right? And ultimately then, the task is not to um, overthrow the bourgeoisie violently. The task is simply to make them realize that they could structure society in a different way. And really to make everyone realize that you could structure society in a different way and you wouldn't have these tremendous, tremendous problems that existed in his own society. Um, again, interesting to think about in relation not only to Bellamy's own time, but to our contemporary debates over inequality. Um, we could think about whether or not that stagecoach analogy still applies. There are certainly many individuals who think it does. The whole kind of OWS, Occupy Wall Street, 99% um, versus the 1%. That is the stagecoach analogy, right? <laughs> They're saying that this existed in the 19th century. In some ways, it exists in an even more pernicious form today. Um, but a lot of people dismiss that. A lot of people dismiss Occupy Wall Street, and they dismiss that whole notion that there is you know, um, a fundamental divide between the classes in the United States. So these are debates that we're still engaged in. Um, and... These problems play a really important role in the novel itself. Um, Bellamy talks a lot at the outset about the labor problem. Um, he is in the process of building a house, and um, he's going to live in that house with his soon-to-be wife, Edith, and it's um, not being built because of constant strikes. The workers who are supposed to be building this house are constantly striking. There are constantly um, labor strikes, um, stoppage of work. People are protesting in the streets. Um, there's you know just disruptive protest occurring constantly to the point where if you're trying to get something done, like trying to build a house, it can be a very time-consuming process. And what Bellamy is really talking about is the formation of the modern labor movement, which was occurring at the time he was writing. We're seeing the emergence of the first um, organized protest struggles um, that would lead to the formation of, of contemporary labor unions. Um, the working class in 1887 simply didn't have the protections that we have today. Um, they And they arose eventually not out of goodwill, not out of humanitarianism, but they arose out of the fact that um, capitalism couldn't function without some sort of stability with regard to labor. We needed to have individuals um, who would be employed, who would be healthy, and we couldn't continue to have this stoppage of work, this um, these strikes, these confrontations between uh, bosses and owners and, and their labor force. So um, the labor the labor problem that Bellamy is talking about was um, the series of strikes that began to emerge and really for several decades um, characterized the U.S. economy and economies in Europe. Um, workers were striking because of hours, because of safety, because of health, because they had no unemployment insurance, they had no disability coverage, um, attempts to form unions, attempts to form some sort of collective bargaining unit were often met with force. Um, it was not uncommon for workers to be summarily fired if they attempted to form some sort of um, collective bargaining unit to bargain in their interests. 
And um, all of these things have subsequently been addressed via legislation, but they were only addressed because of collective struggle on behalf of the working class. Um, so that's, that is the starting point <clears throat> for this novel, is this um, presentation of society via the stagecoach analogy and Bellamy's own discussion of how the labor problem is becoming so acute that uh, capitalism is in danger of really ceasing to function. Things can't get done. Um, projects can't be completed. Homes can't be built. Right. Uh, industrial workforces are striking and um, becoming violent. Right. Um, a little bit of the context for the novel. It is a work of utopian fiction. And the reason why it's a work of uh, utopian fiction is the fact that Julian uh, West, the main character, goes to sleep. Um, he's actually he's put into this um, kind of hypnotic trance in 1887. And then ultimately he wakes up in 2000. Right. So his depiction of the stagecoach analogy and his discussion of the troubles with regard to labor um, that is when he's talking about 1887. He's talking about the late 19th century and the, um, the historical context, the, the experiences that he's having at that time. But then he wakes up in 2000. He wakes up um, about 113 years later. He um, is kind of shocked initially, right? The... Um, the initial experience he has is one of shock. Apparently what had happened, he'd been put into this hypnotic trance. He um, had not aged and he hadn't died. And the home that he lived in, he kind of had this, this vault that he went down into. Um, and the home had burnt down. And I guess no one knew about this vault and so they assumed that he had been killed. They assumed that he had died, and they never really looked for him. They never found him within the rubble. And it turns out that he was, in fact, alive. He was just in this um, this strange kind of state that he had been put into. Um, and so when he wakes up in 2000, the world around him has completely changed. He's found by this family, the Leets, and we see immediately the psychological impact of this upon him. It's not overly surprising. He thinks that there's some sort of trick being played on him. He's distrustful. He's incredulous at first. Um, but then as he, as he begins to look at the world around him, what has changed in that period, he, um, he begins to investigate society and kind of try and figure out why everything is so completely different because it really is a completely different society. A lot has changed in, um, in the hundred years or so that he's been, he's been asleep. So um, the novel is ultimately about awakening, right? It's awakening in the literal sense that Julian goes to sleep and he wakes up in 2000, but it's also in a more metaphorical sense, right? He wakes up physically, but... Um, but it's also kind of a, a play on that concept because he wakes up um, in a broader sense as well. The novel's really about uh, Julian West, who was a product of his own time, you know, a thought that that stagecoach analogy was inevitable, thought that that was how the world would work. Um, he begins to realize that another world is possible because he's seeing another world in front of him. And that is really what Bellamy desperately wants his own readers to grasp. Um, the society that they're living in in 1887 um, is, has all sorts of problems, has all sorts of shortcomings. And his fear is that people will look at that society and they'll say, well, you know, this is inevitable, right? This is a capitalist society. There are winners, there are losers, and um, people are going to suffer. And that's just, that's just how a capitalist society works. And that's how um, human nature works. Right? Not everybody can be on top. Not everybody can be comfortable and happy and prosperous. And Bellamy doesn't think that's true. Bellamy does think that um, you know, capitalism, although it's productive, although it accomplishes pretty amazing things in terms of how much it can produce, it is still a woefully deficient system 
And going back to that idea of um, social evolution, he thinks that if we have a deficient system, we will, as a society, um, evolve beyond it, right? He thinks that that's inevitable. And so he views himself, in a certain sense, as helping society begin to realize that they still have a deficient system and to try and um, move beyond it, to try and recognize that it's not inevitable. Um, so just to set up uh, the novel for you guys, the go through some of the characters uh, really quickly and then talk about the utopian leap, what makes this a utopian novel. Um, key characters, there really aren't very many characters in Looking Backward. Um, it is kind of interesting because the, you do have the 19th century characters and then you have the 21st century characters. Julian West is the only one that um, resides in both time periods. The novel kind of jumps back and forth at various times between the 19th century and the 21st century. Um, Julian West is the only one that ever appears in both of the different time periods. Um, Julian West is the main character. He's the one whose awakening we are examining. He's educated. He is wealthy. He is um, riding on the top of the coach. If we go back to the stagecoach analogy, he's definitely on that coach. He's not pulling it. And um, how he made his money is, is really, you know, inheritance. I mean, he, he's, he's, um, he's like the trust fund baby, right? Uh, his family was very successful. Uh, they ensured that he would be successful. They sent him to a good school. They kind of set him up within society. And so he's never really had to work. He's never really had to be on the other end of that, um, that, that stagecoach, pulling the stagecoach. Um, in the 19th century, we also are told of a character, Edith Bartlett. She's um, West's bride-to-be. Um, she's also wealthy. She comes from a well-to-do family, right? So they are um, this kind of bourgeois couple. And they really, at the the close of that section of the novel, the close of the 19th century, they kind of have their whole life ahead of them. If they can just get past this this labor trouble, get their home built, um, then they can begin to live this comfortable, um, luxurious life associated with being in the upper class in the 19th century. Um, they are postponing the marriage until they have a home to move into. And as we said, because of the labor issues, that's taking a really long time. Um, and that's where that section, the 19th century, um, that's where it stops is this moment of, of their impending marriage and this home being completed. Um, but that's where we jump to the 20th, 21st century. The key characters that we encounter in the 21st century, again, we see Julian, right? Julian has woken up in the 21st century, but we also see, um, this family, um, we encounter Dr. Leet, Mrs. Leet, um, Edith Leet, who is their daughter. She's ironically also called Edith, and we will eventually find out that she is um, related to Edith Bartlett. And um, they're this incredibly nice, incredibly warm, welcoming family. They encounter this guy from the 19th century, and... Um, they don't view him as an oddity. They don't view him as a sideshow. They really have tremendous care for Julian. And they're really, they know that this experience is going to have an impact on him. It's, it's going to be very hard, very challenging for him. Um, and so they try to cushion his, um, his experiences and, and kind of a, gradually allow him to adjust to the world that he's, he's woken up into. Um, and that's primarily, you know, those are the characters that we have in the novel. Um, <clears throat> there are a series of lengthy conversations between, uh, between Julian and Dr. Lee. That is the, the way that we end up learning the most about the society in which he's woken up in. Um, he kind of explains all of the different details and how things came about, the historical trajectory of some of these changes. Uh, so those are kind of the primary characters here. Um, now, what's really striking um, in, in the new society is how the economy has been reformed. And primarily looking backward, 
is about the um, economic reforms that have been made in this new society, in this future society, and how they've shaped and um, kind of impacted social relations as a whole. So um, Julian West notices a lot of things immediately, some kind of superficial things. Um, he notices that Boston is not the dirty, crowded city he remembers. He, um, he thinks it's, it's much cleaner. It is much cleaner. Um, everything seems to have basically been rebuilt. He doesn't recognize any structures immediately. But what he's really interested in as he, um, as he emerges out of this initial state of shock are the social and economic and political changes that have occurred. And so Dr. Lee tell, starts to tell him about some of these things. Um, the first really significant one is what's happened with regard to private property. Um, so on page 33, um, this is discussed. And uh, what we find is that um, private property is now at least partially collectively managed and owned uh, in the United States. Um, not all private property. I mean, there still is some realm for people to own things, right? Um, but the industry and commerce of the country are given over to public management. So basically what that means is the means of production are given over to um, public management. Um, factories, uh, banks, stores, commerce, all of those different things are, not, uh, are no longer owned by um, private entities, be they individuals or corporations, but they're, they're owned by the state. Um, and what's even more amazing is that this occurs without violence. Um, basically, Dr. Elite says that corporations realize that there are much greater gains in efficiency to be had by organizing everything on the largest scale possible. And he says that men begin to take it as an axiom that the larger the business, the simpler the principles that can be applied to it. So um, Lead is essentially saying, yeah, we realized it was incredibly, um, incredibly, you know, inefficient to have all of these different companies competing against one another. And we essentially collectivized them into, um, into one great large company that was owned by the people and administered by um, the state, right? Um, and he says that this, this was done without violence. This did not encounter violent resistance. Um, that was an idea that we would see implemented in you know, various communist societies. Um, it didn't really transpire without violence in most instances. Uh, if you look at, in the Soviet Union, they did this with agriculture, where all of the private farms were taken over by um, the state and taken over by the, the Communist Party. And that was an incredibly violent process um, as people were relocated as people um, resisted their private property private property being taken away but um, but Bellamy does have this faith that that can be done without violence um, essentially you know corporations people will just realize that this ought to be done um, the second thing that we're exposed to that's kind of interesting is what's called the compulsory national labor service um, so if all of the aspects of society are going to be publicly owned, how are people going to be employed? Well, Leet says essentially you create this industrial army, um, similar to you know a regular military army, but people aren't engaging in fighting, they're engaging in labor. Um, so from the ages of 21 to 45, everyone's going to serve in this industrial army. Um, professions are selected in a certain way. We all are going to partake in the National Industrial Army. We have to figure out who's going to engage in what profession. And essentially, Leet says there's this collaborative effort between education and the labor sector of society to attempt to ensure that individuals end up in professions that suit their, nat their natural aptitude, so what they've shown themselves to be good at, and what they want to do. Um, and selection is merit-based, right? So you're, you know, whether you become a doctor or um, a lawyer or a professor or you know, whatever profession you choose, um, you're going to be choosed on the basis of merit. So there's an incentive for you to try and be the best that you can be within that um, within that that profession. And um, 
They also note that there are arduous professions that are going to, um, you know, that people are going to have to fill. You're going to have to have coal miners. You're going to have to have ditch diggers. You're going to have to have, um, you know, dishwashers. Um, and the way that you incentivize people into wanting to engage in those professions is to, um, to make the positions themselves more attractive, right? So if it's a really arduous position, um, you uh, have them work shorter hours. You have them have more privileges. You'll notice, though, that he doesn't say wages. Um, it's not that we incentivize people uh, into these more arduous professions with wages. And there's a good reason for that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit in the next lecture, um, but, but essentially they've fundamentally restructured wages in a really important way. Um, and lastly, and this is really essential, uh, everyone in the compulsory, compulsory National Labor Service is um, going to participate in what's called the Common Laborer Pool for a period of three years. So from 21 to 24, um, you're, you have to participate in unskilled labor. Everybody, no matter what their circumstances, no matter um, who, the, who their parents are, how much they have in their bank account, right? Everyone is going to have to um, participate in this common labor pool and, um, you know, engage in some of those, um, those professions that uh, don't require a high degree of skill and in our society, at least, are not looked on as overly glamorous positions. Uh, nobody aspires to be a dishwasher, right? Nobody aspires to be um, a cashier as a career for their entire lives. But, um, but everyone has to participate in that role in the compulsory National Labor Service. And it's not simply about fulfilling need. It's not simply that people have to perform those positions, but it's also about getting people to empathize with the working class. Um, you know, they say that if everyone has to perform these roles, they won't look down upon them when um, they interact with these people in everyday life. Right? You won't um, be snobby with your waiter if at one point in your life, no matter what your circumstances, you had to be a waiter. You had to know what that experience was like. So it's also to change social relations and to bridge some of these gaps that exist between the different socioeconomic classes. And um, lastly, and this is really important, um, as I've said before, when we're talking about this system and we're talking about trying to incentivize people into certain um, positions, they were not talking about wages. They were not saying that, well, in order to get people to um, be you know, dishwashers and ditch diggers and coal miners, we, um, we increase their wages. It's a move away from wage-based incentives, and the reason that is, is because there is a universal wage. Everyone receives the same wage in this system. Um, Dr. Lee claims that wages are not a material question, they are a moral question. Um, essentially, he's saying, and this is a really, you know, this is a, a foreign idea, I think, in um, American society, but he's saying that we don't reward you on um, how much you produce, right? Um, that shouldn't be the basis for um, for how how you get paid. We our, our real key concern is to give you the minimum standard that you need in order to lead a fulfilling and rewarding life. That's what it means to think about wages as a moral question. Um, so the idea is that we all share the same wage, and rather than adjusting the wage on the basis of our work, we adjust the work on the basis of our wage. It essentially kind of flips the whole thing on its head. So if one profession is more taxing than another, or requires um, a greater deal of expertise, or is more physical, or is more intellectually taxing, instead of um, trying to draw people into that profession by giving them higher wages, you, um, you change the nature of the position. Um, you have them work less hours, 
you give them more privileges in terms of their work, um, but not the difference in wages. That remains universal. Everyone essentially just gets a share of the gross national product that's um, dropped into their bank account, and that is universal across the board. Everyone gets the same thing. Um, so um, those are some things to think about, right? <laughs> um, if, you know, we, we could discuss those things in, in greater detail, uh, and that's, that's normally how I'd approach it, but primarily, you know, what I want to do as, as we read through the rest of the book is just kind of draw your attention to certain things that, um, that I think are important in the novel and that, that make us think about um, you know, what Bellamy is proposing. And then you know, just kind of think about these things on your own. Um, think about whether you react to this novel with a certain sense of um, a certain hopefulness. Perhaps you, know, you, you think that this is... Um, these are ideas that should be considered and should be reconsidered and um, as we think about how to restructure our economy or how to emerge from the financial slowdown, financial crisis that we found ourselves in, maybe you think about some of these economic reforms or maybe these things strike you as just bad ideas, right? Maybe these things strike you as um, things which have been tried previously in human history and Though they're good in their intentions, they usually have bad results. Right? Um, kind of a negative perspective, kind of a counterpoint to Bellamy's um, tremendous faith and tremendous optimism in his utopian novel is today's video, which is called Dr. Utopia's Ism. Um, this is another propaganda video. I believe it's from uh, roughly the same time period as some of the other videos I've shown you. I think this is the 1950s, and it's an animated video. It's called Dr. Utopia's Ism. Um, and here, what they're talking about, I mean, the specific version of utopianism that they're talking about is Soviet-style communism, um, which is obviously, it's very different than um, what Bellamy is proposing. Uh, his, I think his uh, idea of socialism is much more democratic and much less focused on a single party, a single ruler, this kind of cult of personality that we see within the Soviet system. But some of the economic reforms are essentially the same. Um, some of the, the economic reforms that he's, he's suggesting in terms of universal wages and, and things like that, we actually do see in Soviet-style communism. Um, and I, I include this... Um, this selection because it gives you some sense of the reaction against utopian thought that I mentioned at the outset. Um, utopian thought has always, particularly in the United States, where we are very pragmatic and um, tend to <laughs> be skeptical of kind of grand visions of improving everyone's condition. Uh, utopianism generates a reaction, and this is the reaction. This is the reaction against utopianism that you see. Um, so as you read this, think about the value of utopian thought, but also think about some of its dangers and think about whether or not, you know, perhaps we should be skeptical of utopian political ideas. For next time, um, we're going to continue on with looking backward. We're going to get more into the substance of society and how some of these changes have come about. And we move beyond um, the organization of the labor force and the organization of ownership. We start to talk about consumption. There's a really interesting model of consumption uh, that we see in looking backwards. So stores and commerce and how people buy their products. Um, but this second chunk of um, readings for looking backward really goes beyond Julian West's initial awakening, right when he wakes up and begins to investigate the society around him, and it moves on to his personal transformation. At the point that we've left off in the novel, Julian West is still basically trying to wrap his head around this new society that he's come into. Um, in this second part of the novel, um, he is beginning to come around and, and really value and, and see the importance of the society in which he resides. And, and um, he's essentially becoming a convert. And he's moving beyond shock to really embracing his society. Um, in particular, pay attention to the section of this reading um, called Mr. Barton's Sermon. I think if there is an instance in this book in which uh, Edward Bellamy is talking to us directly, not through the medium of a character or 
um, you know, uh, a narrative. Um, I think it's Mr. Barton's sermon. It's really kind of um, Edward Bellamy's own perspective, as as close as you can get to Edward Bellamy, essentially just interjecting into this novel, and it's really interesting. So uh, we'll leave it there, and next time we'll pick up with the rest of Looking Backward and kind of finish up this novel. Um, so I will stop there. Thanks a lot, guys.